Hey, it's Christine Blackburn with Storyworthy. Last week, we lost a great comedian, an amazing writer, and a friend. Ron Zimmerman passed away. Over the years, I was lucky enough to have Ron on Storyworthy three times, and each story was funnier than the next. So I thought I'd bring those stories to you guys so you can hear Ron's voice and have some great memories of a really interesting man. Love you, Ron. Hey, it's Ron Zimmerman. Here comes Story Worthy, and it is a very worthy show. Hi, this is uh, this is imaginary doctor Ron Zimmerman, therapist. And if you want to get help, you want to listen to Story Worthy, and you'll get some. This is Ron Zimmerman. You're listening to Story Worthy bumpers. <laughs> <laughs> You can't find me on Twitter. I, I, uh, uh, un- I, whatever. I shut down my Twitter page. I did. Couldn't take it anymore. You can find me on Facebook under just Ron Zimmerman, and I have a fan page, the worst fan page in the history of of, of maybe the entire internet. But uh, uh, but uh, no. Twitter, I had to stop because uh, um, my my I I had my as as you know I have a well known ex girlfriend and uh, and I went from having about you know a thousand followers of people that actually liked me and did anything that I've done to. Uh, one tabloid story and 5,000 followers, 4,000 girls that were fans of my ex-girlfriend that so monopoly, that used my site as, like, as, as sort of like, oh, I see, this must be the, the uh, uh, you know, the, 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 well, I'll just say the name and get it over. This must be the share annex page. <laughs> So I had I nobody I knew ever wrote me or anything because there was always a you know pages of little girls writing you know what's her who, what's her house look like you know how long is her hair <laughs> uh uh you know what did she eat for breakfast and 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 we were broken up too so you know I didn't know what she was eating for breakfast <laughs> and uh and and as 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 sweet as they were they drove me kind of crazy and and everything i was tweeting you know jokes that obviously 14 year old girls weren't going to get and uh to my surprise this woman has a gigantic 14 year old girl fan base uh that are they actually call them so the, the the share crew <laughs> and uh and 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 you know, it's just it, it was just such a nightmare. And every once in a while, somebody would write something mean on there about me. You know, hey, uh, you're too ugly to be with her. And and uh, and then the share crew would jump in and go, "Shut up! We hate you! You know, you know, you know, block this guy! What are you doing? We love Ron!" And, and it was just it got so ridiculous that I just recently I, I decided, you know what, I I, I can't. Uh, I can't do it anymore um, because I never heard from, you know, no, like, like my friends were, you know, I'd put something funny on and, and I wouldn't get one of those, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, Richard Belzer favorited your thing, you know, because he wasn't reading my page. It was full of, you know, everybody, everybody on the page was named like, you know, I love Cher, Cher and me, I wish I was Cher, Cher's hair, Cher's foot, you know. It just became, you know, it was so weird, and none of it had anything to do with me. So uh, I had to, I had to shut that puppy down, and uh, uh, you know, maybe sometime I'll go back on it. Although, I, you know, I'm not so sure. I even under, I, I don't think I ever really understood how Twitter works to begin with. So, 
it, 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 you know, it was always, you know, running out of characters and, you know, just it's characters, you know, characters. That's Chinese, you know, running out of characters. That, that's like that's Chinese. American, you run out of words. You don't run out of characters. You run out of they, they give you so many words. Why can't they just? You know, I, I I fear the internet is destroying the English language, <laughs> and I start this fear started recently with the word selfies. I mean, tweeting, you know, a tweet, a Twitter, a tweet, all that was so horrible to begin with. It's such a rape of English already, but then I don't know somehow selfies just hit me in the face like 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 somebody punched me and it was like selfies and and you know and i heard i, I don't know somebody that, that that i like someone i respect on television and said you know boy it's hard to get a good selfie and <laughs> you know it, it, it's you know somebody that shouldn't even be saying that you know it, it's it's like i mean there's people you just I, you know do you ever really want to hear like bruce springsteen say selfie you know, hey, I got a selfie. Come on, hey, come on, Miami Steve. Let's get a selfie. You know, I, I don't want to hear that. And 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 uh, so, and I blame Twitter for all of this. Facebook seems like 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 fine. You know, it seems like that's enough. Facebook is, it's easy. You you know you can you you don't get a limit on your characters. Uh, you know, it's 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 perfectly fine. Instagram, you know, they might as well give me a Phillips head screwdriver and put me in front of a nuclear reactor and go, "Hey, can you fix this?" Because Instagram, I have no idea how that works. Or, I mean, I'm sure there's a whole language to that too. You know, you have to do an Insta selfie or something. And and so I I just went on the I I just typed it in, went on the site, looked at the page, and I was like, "Oh no, never." Never. I don't know. Never. I can never do this. So all this means I'm old, but uh, but then and then I looked up a thing and it said the like the demographic for each thing was you know Instagram you know nine to to sixteen, Twitter sixteen to to thirty five, Facebook you know fifty to death. And, and 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 that's the you know that's who's on Facebook now apparently it's just people that you know people that have 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 incurable diseases you know people that are they're dying of various col you know colon ailments and and incurable diseases and you know precancerous people are all on Facebook and I'm more comfortable with them you know I, I uh, I'd rather just just. Be with people who hopefully whose 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 funerals I speak at rather than the other way around. Isn't that what happens? I think like even once you're over forty, you're just kind of hoping that that you know God, I I, I hope I get to talk at his funeral and not the other way around. You know, and, and uh, you know, and especially with with comedy, you know, comedians' funerals. You ever been to a comedian's funeral? It's a show. It's not a funeral. It's a show. People write sets and they go up and perform for, because it's like Seinfeld's going to be there. So, so they're auditioning <laughs> at funerals. You're, people audition at funerals to just, you know, it, it's like Paul Reiser's in the, in the Paul Reiser's one of the, one of, Paul Reiser's a, uh, 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 you know, God, I, I can't think of the word. The, the guy, yeah, Paul Reiser's a Paul Bear. Make sure you have a good 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I have seen people do sets at comedians' funerals, and, and I mean, really set like Richard Jenny, you know, who killed himself. And I've still seen people go, I mean, you know, Rich Jenny was uh, was one of my closest friends, and 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 being at his funeral reminds me of this gig we did in Jersey once, where somebody hit Rich with a pie while he was on stage, and. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, just, just, you know, insane. And, and also, there's that thing of you know, I, uh, you know, I, I'm trying. Uh, I promised myself I wouldn't cry because, God damn it, this guy was, you know, he was, he was, he was such a, a great dude. And, you know, 
I remember this one bit he did. <laughs> and then they start doing his material. Which I guess, you know, you say, wow, that's taking the most sincere form of flattery just a little too far. <laughs> you know, and, uh, leaving Hollywood. Well, a year ago, I decided that I'd had enough of, uh, you know, going to, 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 to uh, funeral shows and, and everything else that, that, that comes with being in show business. And I've been, you know, I've been writing and producing bad TV shows for 30 years and, and uh, you know, made, made so many people so much money and somehow not ended up, you know, a zillionaire myself. And I just got to that point where, where you know, my, you know, when your own agent is trying desperately to get off the phone with you to the point where they use that, that you know, the, the agent thing of, of listen, there's a, I got a call on the other line that's about you. I got to go, which is my favorite agent blow off, you know, uh, uh, call on the other line. It's all, it's about you trying to work, work your deal. And you, and you have nothing going on, so you know it's not about you. But uh, um, So I'm from, I was born in a town called Wabash, Indiana. This town is 10,000 people. To put that in perspective, the Staples Center seats more than 10,000 people. So one good wave at the Staples Center is more people waving than Occupy – an entire town in America. So, uh, so I have I have my only family lives there, and some cousins, nieces, nephews, whatever. And and I had one cousin uh, in particular that has been trying to get me to to leave Hollywood and go there uh, because it's you know it, it's it's such a great place to be. And it's cheap and it's, you know, it's real America and, you know, haven't you had enough of the bullshit of show business? And, 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 and just finally caught me when I had had enough of the bullshit of show business. So I was like, yeah, OK, I, I'm 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 ready to go. I was I was living I was renting a house in Sherman Oaks in the valley for like four grand a month and going house broke anyhow and and. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to sell everything I own except, you know, the couch, a bed, whatever. Take my dogs and I'm going to move. She, she had found a place for me to rent that was the most incredible place. I hadn't ever seen it, but she sent me pictures and stuff. And it was a 5,000 square feet house, okay, with a four-car garage that I was planning to make into little studios to shoot all the web series that I was going to make in this, in this town. And, uh, uh, and, and it was on six acres and it was the biggest, it was the biggest lot in, you know, anywhere in town. It was like a mini farm. And I decided I, because I, I, I have a green thumb that I was going to, I wanted to go and I was going to go be a farmer. I was going to leave here after 30 years of, you know, writing, uh, I don't know, Lord knows, you know, line, you know dialogue for uh, Stephen Collins on 7th Heaven, um, I was going to go to Indiana and be a farmer in a town. I mean, to say it's in the middle of nowhere is, is just, is, it's, it's so flattering to the, to the town. It's like... Uh, you know, Indianapolis is two and a half hours away, and and uh, and and I've gone there. You know, I've gone back to visit many times, and always, you know, it's like, oh, the Hollywood guy. You know, hey man, I saw you on this. I saw, you know, they can't couldn't have been, couldn't be nicer. So I thought, well, okay, this might work out as a good life. Everybody loves me. You know, I'll be the town celebrity, and and uh, well. So I pack up my stuff. I I, I drive to uh, my dogs, my three dogs, and me. We and off to to our new farmhouse. We go in to Wabash, Indiana. Uh, you know, which is just only like twenty four hundred miles away. And uh, um, and then we get there, 
And it is a big, giant, old farmhouse. And like a big, giant, old farmhouse, nothing in it works. It's it's so old that the fixtures and things are like you, you walk in and you go and, – and it's like a time warp. You, you, oh, I'm in the Grapes of Wrath. You know, this is – I'm Tom Joad all of a sudden, you know. And, and mama, mama, you know, it, it's – this – the house was so old. There was a, a – the stove in the kitchen had a, a, a – one of those griddles. That, that look really good. You know, you see them in restaurants and it's like, man, I'll be frying the hot cakes and, you know, got a griddle. It'd be great, great stuff. to. Well, that worked for four days, I think, and then just stopped for no particular reason. It was actually a half griddle and the other half was a was a was like a grill. So it was like, well, I'll be making burgers, you know, a chicken and waffles, you know, you know, and uh uh, and then, then the the grill stopped two days after the griddle stopped, and 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 the landlords never came to fix anything. It was uh, it had wallpaper. The house had this wallpaper on it that was peeling off, and you couldn't see any of this in the pictures, of course. But it had little flowers and stuff on it. But what I thought was was a kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a, a beige color wasn't beige it was beige from cigarette smoke everywhere so so the whole house was was i mean you'd open a like like a closet and the cigarette smoke in the closets in the shelves and i smoke and it still made me want to throw up because it was like there was like there must be you know little small town elves in every closet smoking all night and all day and so even they and they left like well we'll leave you towels and things you know half partially furnished and you couldn't you couldn't use any sheets or towels because they smelled like hundred year old cigarettes <laughs> you know when you put your cigarette out in in water and then leave that for for you know a week and the water turns red well that's it was like they washed the house with that water and. And in the center of the house, where the big hallway was down to the to the four extra bedrooms, um, was uh, uh, was an, a whole area with a, another kind of front door. There was two sort of front doors, like farmhouses have a lot of front doors, and and uh, uh, and and where the, the the stairs to the basement were, which is where you go if there's a tornado. And I learned. Uh, late that Indiana is in the tornado belt. It's the corn belt and the tornado belt. Um, so the uh, – uh, and I wasn't rushing to get in the basement because I've seen enough horror films to know in small towns, the basement or the attic of any house is the gateway to hell. So uh, – but the owners had cats and apparently didn't want them to get eaten by the no predators in the state of Indiana – that they were worried about because there are no I looked this up there are no predators in Indiana there's like no coyotes no wolves no bears there's deer uh, skunks raccoons and stuff things that aren't going to eat, eat your cat but they kept the cats in so there was a smell of cat piss in the center of the house that was so pungent it could almost drop you to your knees if you if it if it hit just right. It was it was just unbelievable. And and me and my my nieces and, and nephew we 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 scrubbed this stuff with like that that soap that smells good and every possible thing and nothing could cut through this cat piss smell. And uh, and then every bedroom there there was five bedrooms and every bedroom was was had. The way it was, it's like nothing had been touched since 19, you know, since the first stock market crash. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nothing had been touched. And I remember sitting on, in one of the rooms one night talking on the phone about 11 o'clock at night to somebody and looking around and going, you know, except for the fact that I'm on a cell phone, I could be, I could, this could be 1930. And I'm just in this in a room that doesn't look any different than I know it did in 1930, 
and 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 uh, uh, it was just just well. Anyway, so I went out and I bought seeds and I started digging, uh, you know, digging up, you know, land to plant my crop, and uh, and and now I'm not realizing that that the difference between moving there and visiting. Is very is very unusual, and and somehow even though I can't, you know, my neighbors, I never see them or anything, but, but they're all looking at me. One one day, I uh, I was out, and it, it it also I went and in May, if I got there in April, and by May it was excruciatingly hot and sticky hot. You know, here it's it it gets hot, but it's nice hot. There it's so it, it's East Coast hot. Sticky hot. So you take a shower, and then the minute you step outside, you're wet and sticky again. So you can never, you never feel clean. You're always wet and sticky. And and uh, and I'm out there, and it's so hot that you can't, you can barely wear clothes at all. So uh, somebody had given me a kilt, <laughs> and I go out and I put this kilt on and a wife beater, and I'm out there. Digging holes to plant stuff in, and somebody sees me. Within two hours later, one of my cousins calls me. He's a lawyer, and he's in a, a, a nearby town, and, and and says, "What are you doing wearing a dress out, out and and digging holes?" And I was like, "What?" And I'm like, "Well, it's a kilt, number one." And 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 who? How do you even know this? He goes, "The city attorney lives two places down from you, and his kids saw you." And called their dad to say, "Our the Hollywood guy is wearing a kilt, <laughs> digging holes. <laughs> you know, he's wearing a dress and he's digging holes." And 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 uh, uh, it was it was uh, uh, actually before that there, there was a whole acre of just beautiful grass before the whole before the farm farmage area, and they had one of those John Deere ride around uh, uh, lawn mowers. Which I've never used. I don't know that there's a pattern you're supposed to cut this shit on. And I go out there to cut it. I can't, you know, I can't figure it out. So I end up, and I don't know that people take a, you know, are looking at me in this place. I can't figure it out. So I just cut a giant Z in the back, in the in the lawn. Well, of course, that ends up in the paper. <laughs> that hits the paper two days later. You know. Uh, Hollywood guy that moves here uh, cuts giant Z to mark Zimmerman lawn and uh, uh, and neighbors are furious. <laughs> so uh, um, well by uh, now now after pretty pretty soon I realized that that uh, there's nothing to do there at night or day. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, this town. Now I, I I start going out at night downtown, which is uh, uh, which is a, a five minute walk, and uh, and I do kind of I am kind of digging that there's like no traffic. Oh, by the way, my house, five thousand square feet, six acres, woods, lawn, everything. Thousand dollars a month, um, just to give you a, a little perspective on that. Five, uh, One thousand dollars a month for that, and uh, uh, but you're there, and and uh, so I go downtown and I go to, of course, to, to to there's two bars where everybody hangs out, Smitty's and Scotty's, and uh, uh, and and by the way, I, I also learned that that the the motorcycle dudes in in L.A., like out in Malibu or wherever you see them, like the the the, the you know the Harley riding guys that everybody you know ooh stay clear of them. Okay, those are Hollywood Har- Harley riding guys. They're not they're not you know they're actors. They're they're all extras on Sons of Anarchy. You know they're not really looking to hurt anybody. They they just want to look like guys that hurt people. Where I was having a Harley. Is the equivalent of here of of in in a in an urban place of having a Bentley. Mm-hmm. So, 
if you have a Harley, you're like, you're successful. But you're also somebody that's probably either just out of prison or heading into prison soon. So the the Harley riding guys there, they're not, they're not, uh, uh, you know, they're not working on uh, Sons of Anarchy. They are Sons of Anarchy. These are like real Harley riding guys that have real guns and beat people up for real and are in and out of the prison, which, by the way, is, is four miles out of town. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and I learned that, that these little towns, people wonder where the, uh, where the veterans go. Well, I can tell you, they go to Wabash, Indiana. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you want to know what PTSD really is, go to a town, go to any little town in America, and go to, go to Scotty's or Smitty's Bar, and there's one in every little town, and start talking to a young guy with a crew cut, and you will, your hair will be standing up. By the time you leave, you'll be so terrified and and you'll walk out of there going, oh, God, please don't bring them back from Afghanistan. Please don't bring these people home. <laughs> Start another war. Keep them out of here. Because these poor kids are terrifying. And, and uh, uh, there's, 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 there's kind of a, a, a variety of, of little incidents. Uh, that, that's the – oh, the other, the other thing that, that I thought was great was that as a visitor – Everybody was, you know, I was literally giving autographs when I went for like a wedding or something. When people found out I had actually moved to Wabash, Indiana, they hated my guts. And I'd go to the bar and they would say, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, you're the Hollywood guy. You're the guy you, you, that the, went out with Cher <laughs> and you moved here. Are you out of your fucking mind? I would I swear to God, I'd kill so I'd kill my own child to get out of this town. I hate it here. Everybody hates these little towns. Everybody wants out of these little towns. So if you're somebody that's had a better life and you move back, this is for you, Christine, so, so that you can understand what will happen to you. If you actually did move back and didn't visit, they will hate your guts because because they think you're mocking them by moving back. So it becomes like, like, so what are you doing? Just making fun of us moving here? You know, you know is this just like a, a kick for you to come here with all your fancy money and, and rent the biggest place in town for $1,000 a month? You know, man, if I had $1,000 a month, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd live in Hawaii. And uh, uh, so, you know, so ultimately I'd go in the bars and, Everybody hated my guts after two months. Nobody would talk to me. I wasn't the town celebrity. I was like the the, the town alien. I was I was Mork Zimmerman, and and people just didn't want any. I, I leper a leper a leper planting tomatoes and blueberries in a in a kilt that that everyone basically was just you know, ran from when I would go in a restaurant or store and uh, nobody wanted anything to do with me. And by August, I couldn't get out of fucking town fast enough to the all to the point of the owners who who didn't want to live in this place either said, what if will you stay if we cut the rent in half from a thousand dollars to five hundred dollars a month? And I was like, no. No, if for free, I won't stay here one more day, <laughs> and uh, and then my third one of my three dogs died, and from the heat had a had a heat stroke, and I had to put to sleep <laughs> because <laughs> you got paralyzed from the heat, and I was like, you know what? Okay, you've taken everything else. I'm out of here. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here, and uh, and and. Well, now that I'm a, a, a therapist, a shrink, if you will, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm here for the first time where I'm needed more than usual. And, and particularly listening to the opening of you guys in such, in such ridiculous denial about your, your, what clearly are your endless mental problems. 
feel like I, I got here in the nick of time oh, more yeah. before something <laughs> happens that you know one or both of you are going to regret. And uh, and 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 as I said, I have never heard such such ridiculous denial of uh, <laughs> Christine. Come on, I don't get depressed. I don't get depressed. I just don't. I don't. I've never spent a day in bed, which of course everybody knows. A day, if, you know, you you can only be depressed if you spend the day in bed. That is the only symptom of depression: is spending the day in bed. I think there's there's no question about that, except that there is a question about that because depression, in fact, has a variety of symptoms, 20 of which I've noted since I walked in five minutes ago that you have. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, you know, so, uh, so really, I'm, of course, always here to entertain, but today here to help. And you, Mr. Put Prozac in the Water, yeah. another, uh, well, frankly, insane <laughs> idea since all of these drugs work based on the, each person's uh, body chemistry. So Prozac is not going to have the same effect on me as you. That's why they say you have to be on them two weeks when you start taking them and and then a lot of people have to switch to different things because after two weeks they don't work. And, you know, I, I took uh, Wellbutrin once for two weeks and, and was still depressed and the only the, – the, actually got more depressed. But then – no, and worse was that I realized the one thing that, that, that I, you know, was getting any enjoyment out of it all, smoking <laughs> – like every pack of cigarettes I bought, every cigarette was stale. And I finally, after after about a month on it, I said, you know, and on top of that, I'm not feeling any better. Why the fuck can I get a pack of cigarettes that isn't stale? And he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, Prozac is Zyban. And, and so it doesn't always work with everyone, but it will make you quit smoking. <laughs> so I ended up quitting smoking for three years. And uh, until I moved, to, I, I did a job in Chicago, the horrendous Joan Cusack show. And uh, when you go to Chicago, you get off the plane and they stick, you know, a cigarette in your mouth <laughs> and a piece of red meat in front of you and say, you know, and, and, and a shot of bourbon and go, OK, you're in Chicago. This is how we live. So, uh, um so you know there there are there are such a variety of drugs. Uh, not that I don't think there should you know I mean if anything maybe Valium in the water would be you know Valium tends to you know at least that cools everybody out. An anti anxiety in the water might might work, All right. but certainly not Prozac. You bumbling fool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not a doctor. Well, that's right, and I. And I am because I have a white coat. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, what I've learned is you can, if you go to one of those uniform stores, yeah. you too can become a doctor <laughs> for like, you know, $18. You buy a white doctor coat and, and, and some scrub pants actually really, really finishes it off. And you know what? Everywhere you go. You get treated very differently. People like are nicer to you. They think that you know. Wow, you know, I'm 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 in an elevator with this guy who clearly is in the medical profession. If something happens to me right now, I, I guess he can help. So you know, it, it's 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 uh, it's right up there with with something else I did when I was a kid in New York to not get uh, killed on the subways late at night when I would ride home from Manhattan to to Long Island City and and uh um and I you know the gangs were were yeah. I had to walk a mile through the, the Astoria Queens and the there were gangs and stuff and 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 I figured out that that you know gangs are usually catholics catholic kids so I went to this is where I originally sort of found the the, the beauty of the uniform stores I went to one and bought a priest collar and I used to take it with me and, and when I'd get on the subway to, to go home at three in the morning 
I'd have a black coat, black pants, and I'd put and a white shirt and put the priest collar on, and, and I had a Bible. And I'd sit there very humbly reading my Bible, and the gangs would walk, you know, whatever they were doing. I mean, I mean I've, I've, seen people, I've seen people get robbed in front of me. And, they, you know, it was like, uh, uh, why don't you just stay out of this, brother, you know, and, and uh, um, yeah, and, and, you know, nobody, nobody hassles a priest. And everybody likes someone in a doctor coat. So there you go. And it just happens that I am uh, uh, that I'm uh, almost overqualified to be a shrink because, well, as you said, you know, shrinks the best shrinks are crazy. And there's you know most anyone that knows me will say that there's probably nobody crazier than me. So ergo my qualifications and and. It, it happens to be a subject other than than writing stupid TV shows that I am the most versed in. Well, maybe comic books, and then and then uh, the the psychoanalytic process. So uh, uh, so I I uh, and 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 also you know particularly here in LA, you realize that that you know. Being a therapist is basically – it's sort of like being a producer, you know. You just like – people go, what do you do? I'm a producer. And you are. It's all – you know, magic. The magic of Hollywood. Yeah. I'm a producer. What do you produce? I'm working on a movie thing. I got a movie going. What's it called? It's called, uh, you know, Warhol's Feet. <laughs> oh, right. I think I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. We got uh, Peter Coyote and uh, – uh, <laughs> You know, and Mel Gibson's looking at it, and and really, yeah, yeah, wow, oh wow, hey, who's that guy you're with? It's producer, he's doing the new Mel Gibson movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's how fast you can become a producer, and uh, uh, and and likewise a therapist. You know, and and from that, from from being a, a, a non licensed but who cares therapist. Uh, you know, you can go anywhere, as I think Marianne Williamson is proving right now. You're right. You can. You know, a lot of people use the uh, the the expression "life coach," which I am not. I am not a life coach because if someone suicidal comes to me, for instance, my my therapy for suicidal people is is do it. You know, I, I say, you know, if if you. If you, I, I don't think it takes courage or nerve. I think you know, you know, maybe nerve, but or lack of nerve. You'd have to be so numb that you would do it. But, but you know, if that's your deal, <laughs> you know, and you just don't want to be here anymore, don't be here anymore. You know, what is what does the universe give you when you're born? You know, your life, which you can take whenever you want. It's one of the few powers that that, that is given to us. You know, you can do what you want. You know, it's it's like if you don't like your life, end it. So my suicidal patients, which are now down to zero, <laughs> um, are uh, uh, you, you know I feel like I, I every one of them benefited from me uh, from my therapy because every one of them got exactly what they were searching for, and uh, and wouldn't have you know any other therapist would have tried to save them, help them, you know, keep them alive, keep them depressed, put them on a bunch of medication, have them wandering around, you know, oh, I'm so miserable, oh, nothing works, my life sucks, I can't get a job, oh, 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 boo-hoo, boo-hoo. I, you know, my therapy, they're happier, <laughs> probably. You know, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they, uh, you, you know, my feeling is by committing suicide, the one thing I'm sure of is they're not, uh, you know, who knows – I, what I know is they're not less happy. You know, they're not less content. They 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 got what they want. You know, and and listen, people move in and out of your life. Your life, you know, you 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 meet somebody, you never see them again. Who knows? You know, maybe they die in an hour. If you're suicidal, you come to me. You can be certain you'll die. So uh, you know, it's 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 kind of like like you know, I I consider myself in many ways a. Uh, a Kind of a, a psychological uh, uh, God. I'm on so many drugs myself. I can't remember his name now. Uh, um, uh, you know the guy that kills people. Uh, the, 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 right. I'm I'm sort of a shrink Kevorkian. 
You're, you're basically a lazy Kevorkian. It's like you're not willing to help, but you're not stop. I help. I help. I, you know, I, I listen. If somebody says, you know, I, if I just knew how to tie a noose, I do. So, you know, I'll make them a noose. You know, I won't, you know, they can't do it like right in my office. But, but if, if it's like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't know those nooses that, you know, it's a difficult knot. And, you know, like most knots, it's, once you learn it, you learn it. And, uh, uh, and I, I was suicidal, so I know about that stuff. Uh, you know, it's like here, here's your, here's your news. You know, that'll be three hundred dollars. And uh, uh, you know, and 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 by the way, good news costs about three hundred dollars. So, uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, but but I also I have helped many people that that have remained alive. A positive story about someone that didn't die in my care. Um, well. You two are in my care right now, and hopefully you won't die today. You know that. that um, but uh, uh, there was, uh, well, there's. Uh, you know, I'm right now. I'm interning at the mental facility here, and and so I, I uh, so I see a lot of people. I can't, you know. I mean, so far, except for the ones I have advised, to, except for the suicidal people, all my patients, you know, I have, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, Robin Fitzgerald, who uh, came to me with a uh, was a man. What, what are the you know that that was a uh, uh, you know a man bulimic, whatever you know, man with an eating disorder. And uh, and and this is one of my this is one of my uh, one of my ways of 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 I, I work with this particular uh, uh, I have a particular style of therapy that I use and 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 it's called the the, the cut it out uh, the cut it out program. So he came to me weighed you know about about eighty five pounds. And uh, and and was you know just wilting away. Had you know been a musician, of course, and uh, and uh, you know said I, I I just you know look at me I'm 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 you know I'm obese. And I said you weigh eighty five pounds for Christ's sake. I, I took him in the bathroom. I showed him a mirror. I said what do you see? He said I, I see a fat guy. I said well you're fucking nuts. You're 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 so skinny. And I took him out and. Bought him a, a. I took him to the to the spaghetti factory, and I loaded this fucking guy up with spaghetti, right? And I made him sit there. And every time he 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 he, you know, when he grabbed his hand, to like you know, he, he said, "Oh, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom." I duct taped him to the chair, and and uh, and I just and pretty soon I was just force feeding him food, and I wasn't letting him get up and go vomit it up. And and I watched this guy, you know. After we, you know, after a full day of of spaghetti factory food, you know, he had bulked up about ten pounds, and uh, and and he said, you know, I I I really want to go throw it up. I I feel so fat, and I said, yeah. See, the, what you got to do is cut that shit out. See, every every time you think that you've eaten something and you're fat, what you got to say to yourself is, oh. Dr. Ron says, cut that shit out. Stop saying that. Stop doing that. Finish your meal. You know, you, get a, you, you go to Jerry's Deli. You order one of those. You know how they make those sandwiches? They have way too much meat in them. You know, it's like, yeah, give me a corned beef sandwich. It always has like, like, like a, you know, a, a, enough corned beef that, that a, you know, it's like a work boot amount of corned beef in there. And, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and you go, you eat, eat all of it, eat all of it. And then when you're ready, you know, when you're about to, you know, when you feel like, oh, my God, I'm going to get fat, you, you know, I, I, I better go, go throw up. Cut it out. Stop thinking that. Think about something else. You know, go see a movie. Do something else. Get your, you know, it, it, it's sort of what you said. You, you have a problem. You start thinking about it. And then you think about it over and over and it becomes bigger and bigger. My whole my whole therapeutic uh, uh, form is cut that shit out. Stop thinking about it. Think about something else. This also works with drug addicts, by the way. I have a lot of drug addicts. I, I, get, I probably get 
you know, a drug a drug addiction is another thing that that you know. Uh, I as a drug addict, uh, I know I, I've had a lot of them. Uh, uh, a drug addict, I, I can't reveal the real name. We'll just we'll just call this person the C word. And uh, C word came to me uh, hooked on crack. I said, "You're hooked on crack. You you know you seem like an intelligent person." You know, I talked to them for a while, and they were, in fact, an intelligent person. I said, now, you're an intelligent person. Are you suicidal? No. I said, you're not suicidal, but you're doing crack. Crack will kill you. Yes. Then, and you're, but you're not suicidal. Correct. So you don't want to die, but you're doing crack. Correct. Cut that shit out, because it will kill you. If you're not suicidal, cut that shit out. Stop doing crack. And every time you want to do crack... I say, if you're not a stupid person, then then you have to say to yourself, wait, before I do that crack, let me think for a minute. Am I an idiot? Am I stupid? No. Am I intelligent? Yes. Am I suicidal? No. Check again. Am I stupid? No. Am I intelligent? Yes. So what should I do? I guess I shouldn't do the crack. I should cut that shit out. And, you know, over time... That becomes a mantra, and then, and then from that, every time they she got ready to do crack, she she said to herself, "I'm not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. How hard is it? You know that that's that's the basic way out of all these things. You go, I'm not an idiot, so I should stop doing it. If you're not an idiot, cut that shit out that you know is bad. Suicide is painful. Part one. When a person commits suicide, it's a terrible thing. When a person tries and fails to commit suicide, it's just foolish. I am just such a fool. The veteran of at least six failed suicide attempts and at least a dozen more plots, plans, schemes, and scenarios to do away with my greatest enemy, my arch nemesis, the thorn that will not leave my side, me. It's 1967, and I have just turned nine years old. Batman, Bonanza, and Star Trek are my favorite shows, and my mother, a first-class, no, make that coach, idiot, has given me a party I didn't want, ask for, or am capable of enjoying. A boy named Greg Bernstein, who is not my friend, but my mother's friend's son, keeps running up and referring to himself as... Greg Bernstein, as if he's narrating his own life. This is such a great party, and Greg Bernstein is having a really neat time. When he meets other kids, he doesn't say, Hi, I'm Greg, or even, Hi, I'm Greg Bernstein, but, Hi, you're meeting me, Greg Bernstein. (laughs) I can tell that there is something seriously wrong with Greg Bernstein, but I was very self-involved even at nine and didn't care much or long, and will not be mentioning him again in this story, and I'm a little sorry I already did. (laughs) As the party raged, kids ran around eating cake, yelling at the wind, and chasing their tails. That's how I remember kids, human puppies, chasing their tails with no real purpose beyond amusing themselves to no end. I sat in the den in a big flat, light beige chair that my dad used to spend a lot of time looking unhappy in, thinking about what I would be doing with myself once these human puppy people were picked up by their owners and taken home. The answer was nothing. I would be doing nothing because there was nothing to do. My life was meaningless, and I decided this very day worth absolutely nothing to me, and if it meant anything to anyone else, they were stupid or lying. I lived with three people I'm indifferent to, and most of the time I feel like if I smile, my head will crack and fall off into rubble at my feet. My mother is a yappy cluck given to strangely erotic flirtations with my older brother Andy, who I will get to in a minute. My mother likes to talk about sex. She likes to talk about having it with men. It could be my father, her cousins, the mailman, the delivery boy, pretty much anyone with a penis, but more often than not, it's my brother, her son, which is just real nice, isn't it? I call this emotional incest. I don't think my mother and my brother ever did anything, but my mother liked to at least verbally explore the idea that her 12-year-old son might like to. 
My father is Sonny. Sonny is a cool guy, and as far as I can tell, his biggest problem is he is attracted to a woman that likes to make her, th her son think about fucking her. I do not know Sonny's mom. Her name was Grandma Bess, but I have a hunch she was not very good. My dad is rarely home, citing business trips, which I certainly understand and even admire, because our home is a terrible place to be, and any excuse to leave it sits fine with me. When he is there, he's always in a foul humor and quite terrifying, which I also understand and admire. Then there's my older brother, Andy, who is without a doubt or peer, the single most stupid, ignorant waste of flesh and bones I have ever met. It would be 30 years before I understood that he simply, that he was simply what he was programmed to be, a tool of my parents, but at the, but at the time I did, the money it cost me in therapy to learn this only made me hate him more, which I now know says bad things about me and my shrink. And my only defense here is that the guy still is a fucking ignoramus, no matter who pointed him in that direction. My only true friend in the family is whiskey, the dog, not the drink. My mother says that without fail anytime she introduces the pooch, and she always cracks herself up when she does. Naming the dog Whiskey was the result of an entire day of brainstorming. I guess the idea was, since Dad drank lots of it, and we could all pronounce it, and words like booze and whiskey elicited gales of laughter in the Matt Helm is the greatest movie ever made world I came of age in. It was just too perfect. Back to my ninth birthday party. After a while, all my little dunderhead puppy people friends were gone. I continued to sit in my dad's big chair and stare numbly out the window. My mom came up and sat in the identical leather chair across the glass coffee table from me. I mentioned the table because we had one because we had one, so stop expecting one of those awful Danny Thomas stories. <laughs> this this gets plenty bad enough without dragging that poor bastard into it. But every time I hear the words glass top table, okay, see now I'm doing it. Back to nineteen sixty seven. My mom asked what was wrong. Was I ill? Did I need to go to the bathroom? This was always the only problem that idiot brother Andy had ever suffered from, and for him, it was the truth. And as the firstborn, he seemed to have sent, set the benchmark for what could go wrong with a human boy. Andy was a person who never had anything wrong with him besides having to shit and torturing everyone around him with silent gas. He seemed to revel in endlessly passing to alert all within a country mile of the impending movements of his bowels. Of course, he was too stupid to even shit without being told. He could, do no, he could not do the math between gas and shit, so there wasn't a chance he would ever become upset about anything based on reflection. No, Andy's problems were all, advertised, were all addressed with one solution. Shit. My mom, of course, didn't call shit shit or any other reliable names for human byproduct. We didn't get poop or duty, not crap or poo, not number two or caca. My mom had her own word for it that was no doubt passed down from her, and this explains a little bit, Norfolk, Virginia, racist, drawling, gambling, lying, cheating, Jewish, Southern parents. Scum to be sure. We were raised on tink. That's right, tink. Andy, do you have to tink? This was the clarion call around our house. I guess Tink was meant to be some sort of weighted version of Tinkle. Apparently, in her family's pea brains, pea was Tinkle, so shit must be basically the same word because these people were so ignorant, I imagine they feared running out of words. So the decision must have been made that if we simply add gravity to a Tinkle and make it Tink, we will have a name for shit without having to use up extra valuable words we we may need later for something else. I guess they thought they might invent something and want to call it shit. 
perhaps my grandpa George was worried that in between losing all our family's money at the track, hawking my hawking my hawking his wife's sister's jewelry and triple mortgaging all our homes, he might light on that cancer cure he was no doubt working on, and he'd have to call us something and was saving the word shit for the occasion. Whatever the case in our house it was called Tink. The perfect end to this digression is that, of course, as if to defy even a hint of logic or sense, my mother didn't call Tinkle Tinkle. She called Tinkle TT. So even the theory I made up to try to give these people something resembling rhyme or reason is blown to bits. My life was Tink and TT, and on my ninth birthday, I announced to my mother, after assuring her I didn't have to Tink, that instead my problem was that I felt I had no hope and could not find any reason whatsoever to continue living, that life seemed to be nothing but pain and hardship, and from what I could surmise at age nine, it got only worse, not better. I said, I hate the quality of my life and would rather not go on with any more of it. They didn't beat me or each other. There were plenty of worse homes than my bad one. This wasn't an emotional decision. This was just a matter of good sense. I knew life was difficult and full of pain and hardship at nine, so why participate in such an endeavor as I grew older? I understood very early on the concept of diminishing returns, and it would still be four more years before my dermatologist raped me, but that's another suicide attempt story for another day. Well, as you can imagine... Mom was very sympathetic and seemed positive that a good tink might change my attitude. But it didn't. No amount of tink could persuade me that life was worth living, and so a few weeks later I began plotting my own murder. Near the glamorous Rockville Mall in Gray Rockville, Maryland, a slow train ran through the outskirts of the slower town through a gully near our garden apartment complex. The plan was simple. I would stand in the center of the hill between myself and the oncoming train, and when I saw its nose round the corner, just run. Run for my death. And so I did. I saw the giant train nose round the bend, and off I went to end it all by hurling myself in front of the oncoming locomotive. I miscalculated, of course, being a boy with the blood of Wabash, Indiana, and Norfolk, Virginia, ignorant hybrid Jewish hicks running through my veins, and miss being splattered to the winds by the gaping mouth of the train and instead hit the side and bounced off back up the hill like a pebble in a hurricane. My knee was shattered, some ribs, and my nose broken, and thanks to my death not beginning, my life was over. I crawled up the hill, eventually was found, and taken to the hospital. I told anyone who cared, which wasn't anyone for very long, that I had been chasing my ball and simply ran into the train, what with being so focused on my athletic pursuits. Not only was this story not questioned, but it was applauded because it evidenced the end of a frightening, potentially burgeoning homosexual lack of interest in sports. The story was a fine one, one to be proud of. Ron was hit by a train playing ball. That's what boys do, right? He was simply being a normal boy. I'll say this. The experience taught me that to succeed in doing away with my most hated enemy, me, I would have to be a little more clever next time. And as I lay in the room, I shared with Andy, stranded in bed, healing from my sports injuries and suffocating from his odious stench, I knew and swore to myself there would most certainly be a next time to be continued.